Welcome to something to talk about from the Bainbridge Island Senior Community Center, sponsored by Fieldstone Communities Bainbridge Island. Fieldstone offers innovative and compassionate care, and they're now accepting residents. They also offer day stay and respite programs. Call 360-689-4314 to schedule a tour of Fieldstone's beautifully appointed apartments on Rolling Bay today. I'd also like to acknowledge that we are sitting on the land of the Coast Salish people, specifically the Suquamish tribe, the people of the clear salt water. And today we honor them with their generosity and are grateful for their hospitality. Today, we are back with our political guru, David Harrison. Hi, David. I know why you have elevated you to guru now. So uh, well, I appreciate it. <laughs> So I did up? call the election, so there's that. You did. You did a great job. Yeah. Woo. Um, so we should recognize that uh, the, the insightful questions that you folks ask have a life beyond our own discussion because uh, Karen and Reed are getting a lot of uh, people who watch this uh, after we record it, so we should be pleased with that, but it, it does create a premium for the questions that you've been asking and the, the challenges uh, that you issue when you say something, when I say something you disagree with. So uh, we're gonna do three parts as usual. We're gonna do what is actually happening today and is about to happen. Then we're gonna talk about what it means for uh, government for the next year, what's gonna happen at Congress. And then our third and last shorter session will be what it means for the 2024 elections. It's not too early to discuss such a thing. Um, when some of us were younger, uh, we've read, a lot of us read uh, Joseph Keller's Catch-22. And in that book, you laugh all the way through. It's a truly funny book. And then you realize at the end of the book that it's, you're not laughing at people, that the joke is on all of us. And that's true. I mean, what's going on is preposterous, but it affects how the House of Representatives will play its role this year. So uh, as preposterous as it is, it is. Uh, it's also a little bit heartbreaking, and I'll explain why. So uh, there was a member a couple of days ago who said government was intended to be messy. And that's true. You can read uh, my favorite, James Madison, on the complexity of government that they established and, and when, they, when they did the Constitution. It wasn't meant to be messy in this way. That's a total misuse of the idea of the complexity of government. It wasn't meant to be held hostage by five people who don't care about the institution, who are watching how many hits they get on their whatever social media uh, they're using. And, and who just don't care. Um, and who in fact use it as a fundraiser. Um, so uh, the other thing that was said that is some evidence we should send Christina over to see that Kevin McCarthy is hallucinating. He said today, because we took this long, we learned how to govern. That's just astonishing. There are things, it's hard, you'd be hard put to find the thing, things that Donald Trump has said that are quite as preposterous as that. They haven't learned how to govern, they've learned how not to govern. And besides, the House of Representatives doesn't govern anyway, They're, they have a shared responsibility. Um, so I think we should, there's a lot of press narrative about how they, how the, let's see, it seems like Kevin McCarthy by midnight will be speaker. Um, as you know, in the 14th vote, there were only six people who didn't vote for him. And he, if that was five or four, depending on the total number of votes, he'd be fine. What can happen is those last people can vote present. And then at this last vote, just now 214 to 212, that would be all he needs, he needs 50% of those voting. Uh, so if they vote present, they're not counted at that 50%. So, so that would do it for him. And that's what they'll try and get from those last folks. 
they've cut a, a huge deal that's gone beyond what was reported two days ago. So we need to talk about what's in it. But let's the press narrative has been how it, it, it would be crazy for anybody to debase themselves as much as Kevin McCarthy uh, has done to get a job that now is worthless. That's not true at all. This is why it's not true. Even with the concessions he's made, which are huge, uh, it's a the it's a it's a very powerful position, more powerful than Senate Majority Leader, just because of the way the individual senators have prerogatives. Um, so even with the deal, even with one member being able to basically do a vote of no confidence. Kevin McCarthy still wants to be speaker uh, and has had for a long has for a long time. But let me tell you, it's still worth something, and I'll explain why. Um, we should, before I say why I think it's still worth something a lot, um, let me note that we did this. So when when we didn't allow the surge, if we if the surge had happened and Kevin McCarthy had taken 20 seats back then six or eight people would have been allowed uh, the opportunity to vote against them with relatively minor recriminations. It's just the way it works. So they get to play to their public and say they don't like Kevin McCarthy and or that they are holding out for this or that. But because they only won eight or nine, uh, he doesn't have enough of a margin. So in a way, it's kind of like the leverage that was provided uh, Joe Manchin, Kristen Sinema. But at least they were arguing over public policy. They weren't arguing over, you know, this is just awful. Um, so we created a situation intentionally where the fringe would have greater power and that will be painful for a while but it helps us set up nicely for 2024. One of the reasons why we can sleep at night lately is the president of the United States uh, is not Donald Trump and we don't need a recurrence of such things. So politically, this awful thing could turn out to benefit us. What you're remembering is in the Senate, it's relatively easy to get together a coalition of senators who can force a uh, uh, floor vote on this or that amendment. The hold of the speaker, uh, because there's 435 of them in the House, the role of the speaker in framing what gets offered is uh, what goes to the floor and how uh, opposition can be offer alternatives. The role of the speaker is enormous. That's why the uh, holdouts ask for a couple more seats on the rules committee because in the house the rule for floor debate is everything and here's why that's so important i'll use defense as an example there are more republicans that would give vladimir Zelensky virtually anything he wants than there are republicans who would shut him down but this group uh has got some concessions from uh, McCarthy with regard to what his official position would be on how those issues will be considered, budget issues. I'll go into that a little bit more. So what I'm noting is the Speaker of the House has a powerful role in, in uh, doling out favors in committee assignments. He has very powerful role in going to the White House and dickering with Biden and McConnell and Schumer. He has enormous power to determine whether uh, different Republicans than these can frame an adjustment to, uh, to what is being proposed by a committee on the floor. And that's the rule. That's, what's, that's when they say the rule. It's the rule means the discussion as to um, uh, what debate will ensue. In the Senate, sometimes in appropriations, they, they pass a rule that's a voterama, 
and everybody has five minutes and they can do this and that amendment and Schumer's trying to hold the line on things that otherwise might seem sensical. They don't have that in the House. If you're a junior member of the House, your chance to influence how something is going to be framed on the floor is virtually zero. And the power of the speaker and his edge people is enormous. And, and uh, that's why they negotiated some members of the Rules Committee. And that's why they were so detailed in what they got McCarthy to promise. Because when push comes to shove this year, there'll be an enormous ballot, a bo enormous debate over the, de the, the debt limit and associated budget cuts. And the majority of Republicans, though very conservative, don't want to shut down the government. I promise you, it didn't work last time. It never works. You can, I can prove to you that every time Republicans get two days from shutting down the government, uh, that they're going to poll 30 to 70 on that. And that the majority knows that. But what the, these folks have done is tried to tie McCarthy in knots as to how he deals with that issue because they didn't like the omnibus spending bill that was just passed that Mitch agreed to. McCarthy went to them and said, please, please, please don't pass a bill that covers spending through next September. Please don't do it. Get, let us have some leverage. And McConnell said to him, I don't even know whether you can organize your caucus. So I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to have it be a January debate. So they passed a $17 trillion spending bill with a huge increase in defense spending, which allows flexibility with Zelensky. And uh, Republican conservatives are mad about that. And they're pretty unified and being mad about that because they want more control over government spending. The issue is what you get to do once you're mad. And that's what McCarthy being held up for being speaker is about, is what the conditions are for upcoming debates over budget and defense and, and uh, other issues. And that's why, to make a long story short, McCarthy still wants the job because it's by far the most powerful vo voice in the, uh, uh, the um, role in the House. I'm going to say a couple more things and then I'll stop. Um, what would, did McCarthy give up? So I referred to a couple of them. First, he, he gave them the right for one member to call for a vote of confidence. That's amazing, just amazing. But here's why it's not quite as bad as the press is making it. McCarthy all along has had a strong majority of Republicans and Hakeem Jeffries isn't going to participate in the overthrowing of the speaker. So it's all in whether you continue to roll your, uh, you continue to lead your caucus and they can call for votes of no confidence until the cows come home and McCarthy will be able to roll out his majority. Of course, it's what cost Boehner his speakership, but speak Boehner was much, much, more of a centrist than McCarthy has ever dreamed to be. Um, so why didn't these Republicans who didn't support the this particular January 6th insurrection, <clears throat> why didn't they go into cahoots with what well, passes for modern Democrats? It was never close. There was a discussion about whether Fred Upton, who's retiring as a congressperson from Michigan, a moderate Republican could draw enough uh, Democratic votes to become speaker. It's not even close. Remember, these are not moderate Republicans who are voting for McCarthy. They are other conservative Republicans, most of them MAGA Republicans, quite a few of them who voted to not certify the election. They differ with these, the uh, Chip Roy group, uh, tactically. They're not enormous differences in terms of underlying politics. There are quite a cohort of defense hawks, Zelensky hawks, but on the general issues of budget and social policy, immigration, they're not much 
distance, and there's a huge distance between them and moderate Democrats. So they were never going to do that. The other reason why they weren't going to do it is it would be permanent deaths. There would, if you were a Republican that organized the speakership through a coalition, which might have happened 30 years ago, whack when I worked out there, you're that would you would not be elected again. And you just wouldn't. That would not that would be seen as traitorous. So that wasn't going to happen. The other issue we asked, of course, two other issues, and then I'll stop for a minute. One is um, why is this happening to Kevin McCarthy when it never happened with Nancy Pelosi when she had progressives, AOC and the squad and all that? Well, because with Nancy Pelosi was Joe Biden. So the reason why they were able to talk to Pramila Jayapal and cut deals was they had something to cut deals about. All the Republicans are arguing this over their position. Um, they were consulting privately with AOC and Pramila and others over, you know, the nature of the climate incentives or or what the child care tax credit, child tax credit looked like. So there was a reason for progressives to stay on uh, allied. And that is because of what Joe Biden ended up passing, which is the best set of legislative measures since the New Deal. Um, so that's why they wouldn't flee. And of course, Kevin McCarthy, since he's not, the president isn't allied with him, didn't have anything like he could offer them on the policy front. It's just a battle over what position they're going to take. And then the question you would ask is, there are 50 or so members of the Problem Solvers Caucus, including it's equal number of Republicans and Democrats. Uh, Derek Kilmer is involved as he should be. Um, why wouldn't they do something to keep this embarrassing thing from happening to the Republicans? They're problem solvers. Why didn't they solve this problem? They didn't have any place to go. Their position was save Kevin McCarthy. Um, Kevin McCarthy and the, the battlers over this, the Chip Roy and Matt Getz, always knew that those folks, if they threatened to coalesce with Democrats, weren't going to do it. So the reason the problem solvers weren't more powerful is they had no way to exercise that power. Now, when you get at the session, it's a little different. It is true that Kevin McCarthy sets the rules for debate, but keep in mind that those defense hawks are not gonna sit there and watch Putin you know, roll into Kiev. it's not gonna happen. So this is not the end of Republican debates. Um, so what else did, uh, did Kevin McCarthy give them besides a no confidence vote? Seats on the Rules Committee. Looks like they're gonna be a vote in the House on a constitu term limits constitutional amendment, limiting House members to six terms and Senate members to two. Doesn't matter, we're not gonna, it's not gonna become a constitutional amendment. Um, um, agreement that Kevin McCarthy will not spend money he raises on certain Republican primary battles, uh, basically not to shore up alleged moderates. And finally, but most importantly, all new agreement on McCarthy's position on the uh, debt ceiling and budget cuts, where he has promised uh, to argue for uh, 2022 uh, discretionary spending levels, which would mean taking a $75 billion worth of defense spending back and limiting uh, Biden's uh, flexibility with Zelensky. So that's gonna be the official position of the caucus as agreed to by the speaker. And as I noted, the speaker controls uh, the, what gets offered for as floor amendments. So this is going to be really sticky when we get to, I'll get to that the next session. When we get to, when we get to the debt ceiling and budget for next year, uh, they have 
got McCarthy committed to a position uh, that could even uh, include uh, them proposing Medicare and Social Security cuts, but certainly will account, include a huge battle over defense and the Ukraine. So I'll stop there. As you know, I, what I've covered the bulk of our talk but is uh, why M McCarthy would want this job and uh, what he's going to do now that he's got it. Questions, thoughts, concerns? Go ahead and unmute yourself if you have a question. Breathe. Breathe. Um, well, so you mentioned, I think, in passing there, the idea that the that, uh, McCarthy couldn't was agreeing not to spend money he raised on some of these uh, particular races. Is that the agreement between the Club for Growth and yes. the Congressional Leadership Conference? Because I've I've seen a lot of chatter about how that's basically political action committees working directly with members of Congress. Is that is that being overstated in the social media? Well, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I don't think I, I think we know the same amount. It's an agreement with the Club for Growth who felt like they were spending money in competition where, where uh, McCarthy was trying to, if McCarthy has some distance from McConnell, but they both believe that well, I'll give you an example of Washington that, that uh, Joe Kent, McCarthy would never have wanted Joe Kent. Well, Mark McCarthy would have wanted Jamie Herrera Butler to win, even though he helped with her demise. He did not, she quoted him as, as being angry with Trump, which he was. He said, she, it's Jamie Herrera Butler who said that McCarthy told Trump that people were trying to kill him. And Trump said, well, Kevin, maybe they cared more about the election than you did or something. At any rate, my point is, Kevin McCarthy doesn't want wackos running for Congress and Club for Growth does. I'm a little light on just exactly what races he promised not to spend on, and we'll learn more. But it's pretty unseemly for a speaker to cut a deal with an outside group where basically then they get to decide uh, uh, who is beyond the pale and they're, they're more, ex it may be another advantage for us because if they had represented some, if they had sent somebody to the ballot where Bree Camp Perez won, who could, who what didn't want to, try Fauci for murder, they would have won. So uh, it, 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 in a way, it's to our advantage. Other questions, thoughts, concerns, insights, or insults? You know, I heard that three days prior to this session, um, they took the metal detectors out of the- They did. Um, um, who made that decision? I mean, I, I don't understand. If they're not even sworn in yet, who can make that decision? They made it at the- as a caucus in November, when they were with the, the previous Congress, that they makes were, me very nervous. I well, how do, how do you like to be a member? You know, it's in 1953 or 54, uh, three congressmen got shot from the gallery, and uh, so, so uh, this is this is they're 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 endangered. By yeah. The, I mean, these are a representative. Well, I don't, you know, I don't know where the metal detectors are because they're still on the Senate side. So I don't know how that will work with the architecture of the uh, Capitol. Yeah, I, maybe Christina knows this because she's been there yeah. recently. Do you need to go to detectors to get into the building or do they have separate entrances, the Senate and the House? Well, you do to get, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, I haven't been to the Capitol. I've been past the Capitol. I haven't done the tour oh, yet. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, it certainly seems like, I mean, you go in and you can go one direction or the other, but I, I can't imagine that it's meaningless or they want to, I, I don't know. We can check for next month. Yeah, it's I just crazy. think- Whatever, it's a crazy thing. It's insane. I mean, considering we were just, we just two years ago today that we put up with this insurrection yeah. and then 
we have, a, you know, gun toting people that are sitting in our House of Reps right now that, you know, kept trying Nancy Pelosi by con continuing to bring their weapons. Mm -hmm. I just, oh man, it just no. is unnerving to me no. personally. Absolutely. So. Okay. Other questions or thoughts? Uh, I can go on to issue number two. So the, let's visit uh, what's going to happen this year now that these things have happened. And uh, so, uh, as I noted, the big substantive issue. So some very wise person, maybe Joe Biden himself, talked to Joe Biden when he got elected and said, it is traditional to where first, because of we lost 15 seats when Biden won the presidency, which we didn't need to lose. And some of us believe that maybe that the term, the three word term, defund the police might have been an inarticulate way to call for police reform and might have cost us 15 votes. And therefore, the uh, nine or so votes that uh, they picked up this time, got them back. So to, when Biden won, we lost 15 House seats, uh, and that's what made it so close. So at the, when Biden won, somebody might have said to him, Joe, get everything you can get. You only got 50 Senate votes, thanks to Donald Trump. We won to the two seats in Georgia. So talk mansion and cinema and the whatever you could talk to and pass bills by reconciliation, and then talk to Mitch about infrastructure and about computer chips and nail it, because two years from now, the chances you're gonna win the house are slim. And we almost did, partly due to the Dobbs decision. So now we get to, to, uh, to the situation that we didn't want, and we have to recognize that these next two years are not gonna be a time of great legislative victories, they're just not, because at minimum, uh, remember when you're passing the reconciliation bills that allowed you to get things done with 50 votes in the Senate, those same bills were passed in the House um, and they're not gonna be passed in the House. So the chance to pass big budget res reconciliation bills is zero. Uh, it's just not going to happen. And if there was something that Republicans wanted, they wouldn't do it. And that way, there would be some kind of bipartisan deal cut in the House somehow. So the big issue is the, the debt ceiling, which is $31.4 trillion, will run out of ceiling by summer. And the issue will be what kind of deal is cut to lift the debt ceiling so we can operate the government. A lot of this debt was incurred during the COVID with Donald Trump was president. So it's, it's not just, in fact, the annual debt has decreased under Biden. But anyway, we need to raise it. There's no question. Um, even if we balance the budget immediately, we need to raise it. Um, uh, so what, they just promised is that the Republican House position would be 2002, 22 spending levels, a cap at those levels, and then you would need 60 votes in the Senate to support that. And that, that will never happen. So this will be a classic, epic showdown. And as was the case in 2011, eventually someone will say to, Congress, uh, you know, back then, uh, uh, the, the our debt ratings, our, the, our ratings on our debt were de went down a level. Uh, we almost defaulted. And so market will see that all of a sudden, uh, the market will drop by 10% or so. And then somebody will go to the Republicans in the House and say, will you please stop? And then eventually they will. What's different from 2011 is there are fewer Republicans who care about what J.B. Diamond or some CEO thinks. Uh, they're, they're, they just don't care. And so the hold the Republican Party has on that process, of, I mean, the, the corporate leaders do is lesser. So it'll draw out the struggle. But the good news is eventually the American eventually 
the people in the Republican Party in the House who do not want to close down the government will prevail. It's just how much agony we go through and what spending concessions that Schumer and Biden make uh, to, uh, to facilitate. What we do know is things that we did are safe, the infrastructure bill, uh, the climate incentives are, are gonna be there. What went the way of all flesh is unfortunately the child tax credit, which is done, which was lifting kids out of poverty. What else will be up this year? Uh, almost nothing. Ukraine support within and outside the context uh, will be up. And again, the issue is that, that uh, McCarthy controls how things come up on the House floor, but the majority of House Republicans continue to uh, support uh, Zelensky. The choreographing of Zelensky coming in in December was entirely intentional. And to this day, Biden will not directly attack the 60 or so Republicans who are Putin apologists and who don't want it, and isolationists. So uh, that will find, you know, it's not, Putin's not gonna to uh, roll into Kiev and Biden has enough power in the presidency to, uh, for us to stay dear friends of Ukraine, but it's not gonna be without a struggle this year. That's pretty much what will happen all year. As, as you know, uh, federal judges don't go to the house. So the fact that uh, uh, Raphael Warnock won in Georgia and we added Fetterman is, actually puts us in a little uh, better shape we were in the Senate. Cinema announcing that she's not um, a Democrat doesn't matter. So she's not going to caucus with Republicans. So we have the same seat distribution on committees a little bit better than we had. Uh, so we did all right. And that's what's going to happen in Congress next year. I'll stop there. And then uh, we could talk about what this all means for the presidential election. Questions about what's going to happen in Congress this year, as predicted by David Harrison. Uh, Tom? Me. You want to unmute yourself, Tom? Okay. I heard uh, Michael Moore being interviewed on one of those talk shows, and he said that uh, there's a very good likelihood that uh, Democrats would be in the majority, you know, during this period in the next two years because of people leaving, quitting, dying, and so on. What, they only need a couple of seats. They, that seems to change, you know, they seem to change a few seats almost yearly. So it's not impossible that they could pick up a couple of seats. And I think this, you know, the mess that's happening now in the, uh, in the House would help in any, in a, in a, if a Republican retired or died, be unlikely, I mean, it'd be a lot more likely they'd elect a Democrat because of the way they've acted. Yeah, so I don't know. It, it sounded it sounded pretty uh, interesting to me. Well, um, somebody might be able to help me on this, but the vote uh, just just now was. So I th I think what we've got is uh, two twenty two to two twelve, with one seat uh, empty. So I think uh, if that's a Democratic seat, I think it's still, it's going to be either four or five. And every time a seat is, Democrats die or retire too. So as you are noting, it'd be pretty hard. It's only in swing seats that there are Democrats or safe seats. It'd be pretty hard to see a Democrat die or retiring. And to lose that seat under this climate would be, unusual, but I think it's a, a long haul to, to win five or four. It's worth watching uh, for sure. Uh, you start getting close and you can start hoping for a defection, but defections go both ways. Defection is the end of somebody's career. When I was in Washington, Jim Jeffords, who was Republican Senator from Vermont, 
defected in order to become chair of, of uh, Senate Education and Labor during Reagan's day and Democrats took over and nobody saw it coming. So that could happen. I think it's a long shot to, if it was two seats, I would see it. And the hell of it is, heck of it is, as you know, we lost some races by a few hundred votes. We almost did this. We were almost won it. Uh, um, I do believe it's interesting, uh, Tom, in our neck of woods, there's a new conservative from Kalamazoo that's a redistricted district. And uh, the, re the Democrat, not supported by DNC, and nobody paid attention to him, got 46.5%. You just wonder whether DNC had a, as much ambition as they should have had under the circumstances. Mm. Other questions about what's going to happen this year, and then I'll turn to the yes. Okay. You're I, muted. I, yeah, there we go. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, given McCarthy's disinclination to distance himself from Trump, what do you think it will be Trump's influence? What has it been in all of this negotiation, and what do you think it'll be going forward? Is he pretty much a puppet master? No, I don't think so. I mean, obviously we don't know for sure, but he was never uh, loved as a canny strategist. Uh, and I don't, I think if he was deeply influential, McCarthy wouldn't be in this 14th round. I think Trump meant what he said two, three days ago, you know, he, he said, let's, Let's not waste a great victory like this slim majority is a great victory. No, I think uh, I think they all think Trump is done. I think they're divided between conservatives who think he's botched the elections for them and conservatives that don't. But most all of them are not going to publicly. If they're in Congress, they not, didn't stay there by publicly criticizing Trump. And so I know I think they're. I think they're happy to have it be done and they're not, um, uh, for instance, he opposed uh, the omnibus spending bill, they passed it. He opposed infrastructure, they passed it. Um, I think um, he's isolated and they do not, they think they have to say that they love him, but they don't think they have to be held to, they don't think he can hold them accountable for individual votes. And, you know, Lauren Boebert on, on the House said, Mr. Trump, you know, tell Kevin to lead. So, and she won by 300 votes. So shows you how much she was worried about what he might say. No, I don't think, I think, I don't think, the other thing they think, I'm sure, is this new guy who is the special counsel is a, just brought in a couple more people who are experts in government fraud. They think he's going to be indicted yeah. by yeah. Merrick Garland, and they're right. <laughs> and so it makes them a little less enthusiastic. Yeah. Um, and uh, even more so because DeSantis is such a thing. Uh, uh, my own feeling is Charlie Chris was an awful candidate. And if he had let the mm -hmm. woman who was Florida Agricultural Commissioner run against DeSantis. DeSantis still would have won, but not by 10%. Well, time will tell whether DeSantis is the real thing. But I will say this. If you read in Atlantic or these other magazines how DeSantis is the same thing as Trump, it's not true. I mean, it is true that Ron DeSantis uh, represents a danger to liberal public policy, huge danger, maybe more than Trump, but he believes the constitution exists. He wouldn't try and overthrow the government. He reads things. He knows you know, the various amendments and what they're supposed to represent. And so the idea that he's a reincarnation of Donald Trump, I think Trump was a whole different kind of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other questions? Okay. Great. I'm wondering about the rules changes that you talked about in the first segment and whether they will be anything that could be exploited by Democrats to try to push forward things that, um, or, or is it pretty much just a, uh, a win for the 
uh, kooks on the right. In terms of the rules changes that put different people in power in establishing the rule for debate, it's all negative for us. They would never use it to set up a special opportunity to to offer a democratic run amendment. However, there is some language in there about uh, open amendments and certain appropriations processes, and that means open. So to the extent that the Freedom Caucus is trying to empower people to be able to say things on the floor, we'll have to see what the actual detail is, but that kind of process like they have in the voter realm on the Senate side helps Democrats as well as Republicans. I'm a little concerned about uh, Jim Jordan being the head of the Judiciary Committee. You should. Oh, that's funny. I left it out. The other thing that will happen this year is keep in mind that once somebody's a committee chair, especially a, com a committee that, that traditionally exercises subpoena power, that they have enormous uh, unchecked power. And obviously, uh, Adam Schiff and the intelligence and, and the various judiciary chairs have have uh, gotten their caucus to go with them. But Jim Jordan doesn't need uh, uh, the support of, of uh, more careful people to do what he plans to do with uh, Hunter Biden and, and others. And that doesn't rise to the level of a House vote until somebody's held in contempt of Congress. So, so you can do a lot of investigating and and public uh, execution uh -huh. short of the House vote, and nobody's going to rein in that. So you will see Hunter Biden and some, and maybe the immigration managers and some others uh, cooked uh, big time. And what you're hoping there is for classic Republican overreach. That's that's the only defense. Yeah. I mean, you're sitting and saying, I could refuse to testify. Well, they won't hold me in contempt of Congress. Well, the courts uphold it. We've been through that. But mm -hmm. uh, I don't think, I think if they had a one vote majority and Jim Jordan was chair, he would still do that because he's Jim Jordan. Yeah, exactly. So let's go to our last segment. Um, again, this is... Uh, if there is good news, the, the uh, it's that, uh, hold on, let me find out where I am. It would be good if I was on the right page. Uh, um, I, I heard somebody say that they think that Jim Jordan might be the next jo Joseph McCarthy. Well, <laughs> I mean, killing they, to me. <laughs> you know, if you said that to his face, he wouldn't reel it for her. <laughs> yeah, he's a bad person. It's interesting because, as you, some of you who follow this know, Hakeem Jeffries is the, the, the new a minority leader. And, and, um, and now I'm forgetting the majority whip for Massachusetts, um, Kathleen Clark, uh, and then Aguiar from California. So this is a good leadership team. Jeffries was interviewed the other day. He has no relationship with McCarthy at all. He has said, very critical things in McCarthy. And he has a working relationship with Scalise. So it's funny, uh, not funny, it's heartening that that even exists. Um, when I was out there, it was common. And, uh, but it's not so common now, but they're, they don't make a big deal of it. But to this day, half of the business of Congress is, is bipartisan. It's just the part you hear about that's not. You could still, Christina could go in in February to a markup session of some not very on science and technology or some committee and see people with their sleeves rolled up doing markup of, of legislation, but not very much of it. But I'm just saying that still happens in Congress today. So let's go on to, uh, to uh, the presidential election. This is what we know 
This is what I know that nobody else knows. Joe Biden's not running. I can promise you Joe Biden's not running for the same reason as I said last month. I know I'm 75. And similarly, he knows he's 82. Oh, you, he's going to be 82 when he runs. It's not hard to remember when you get out of bed in the morning that you don't necessarily want to fly to China that day, even in a nice plane. So, so that's what I'm thinking. I don't think he's running. And I hope he doesn't run because I don't think I don't I think we need a generational change. Now let's think about who's going to run. The thing is, if you're a Republican member of Congress, this is not helping you, even in the Senate. So Josh Hawley, Ted Cruz, they weren't going to run win for anything anyway. But what you want to be, if you're a Republican or a Democrat, is a governor. So uh, Gretchen Whitmer said the other day she's not running. Uh, Josh Shapiro or Pennsylvania or Gavin Newsom or the new governor of Maryland. Asa Hutchinson, the Republican in uh, Arkansas. There'll be lots of governors. Nikki Haley, former governor. Um, there's another thing going on. I think I mentioned before, Klobuchar has to, her Senate term is up. She'd have to give up being in the Senate to run. That'd be a stupid thing for her to do. Um, and uh, the same is true for Elizabeth Warren. So I think that that means the senator who is interested is Booker. Buttigieg is on TV as much as he possibly can over Southwest Airlines. And that means that, that it'll be a governor, I think, um, uh, on both sides. What do we have going for us to remind ourselves of the upcoming awful budget showdown? Whatever stupid things Republicans do with regard to Zelensky and Ukraine, they will pay for. Uh, we have choice still going for us. Public is with us on choice. As long as we're careful, they're with us on, on gun control. Um, uh, we have Trump, apropos of Jane's question, we have Trump on our side. Uh, there's new data on what happened during the election. And basically, he <coughs> places he campaigned, he accelerated Democratic turnout more than Republican turnout. And um, that's what we have going with us. We might have going for us the fact that DeSantis is already playing to the right wing. DeSantis is a strong candidate, but you don't run for, these are winner take all prior primaries as I've noted, and you don't win them on the Republican side by tacking toward the center. What you do instead is you win it and then if you're going to tack toward the center, try and win independent votes, which Trump was unable to do, um, you do it then. When DeSantis started going back after COVID vaccinations a month ago, that was puzzling to anybody who thinks he's going to try and win the center. He did it because he wants to win the right first. But that's helpful to us because the more of that investigating people who invented a vaccine that saved a million or so of us from dying, uh, the more he does that, the better off that we are with independence. What works against us before we close? Um, we have to have a new candidate. We could nominate somebody who's, who's not a great candidate. We have a history of nominating people who, who were not comfortable in people's backyard barbecues, we could do it again. I don't think we will. Um, Tom and I will nominate Sherrod Brown, except he's up again, so he'd have to give up his Senate seat. Um, um, the economy could be against us. We'll see if the market's back up, inflation is fixed. There's a little nice note this morning on that. Economy could play well, but if it doesn't, you know, Maybe choice will have receded a little bit as the dominant issue, and maybe that will hurt us. Um, what I'm most afraid of, I'm not afraid of them passing endless bills on who can use the bathroom in the high school. I just don't think that we're going to lose a national election on transgender athletes and bathrooms and such. 
I think it's pathetic that they selected that as an issue. I think, uh, but I do think immigration is a real issue. And now we'll close on that because Biden did something yesterday that was very interesting. Biden uh, expanded Rule 42 and now has four countries where if you enter illegally, there's a, you're, well, taking 30,000 asylum seekers a month from those countries. And if you enter illegally, you have to apply from where you are because if you enter illegally, you'll disqualify yourself from that legal process. So he's about to get battered by Democrats and, and immigration advocates. I'm sitting there thinking, why we got to do something? Because it sure looks to me like we're not anticipating that we didn't. And how many stories can we watch on TV where they, the mayor of El Paso says, we've got 2,000 people uh, sleeping in the streets. And then we say, oh, we're building some new facilities. Did no one anticipate these matters? So I'm, I'm off the reservation. I want to know what, I know we would like Congress to pass a bipartisan bill. I know we would like people to be humane. In the meantime, please tell me what our policy is so I can defend it, because it's not so clear in the first year of this administration that they anticipated that the end of Rule 42 would cause a nightmare at the border. So what Biden's trying to do, and has worked with Venezuela so far, is keep people at home while they apply for asylum. The reason why people don't want to be kept at home when they apply for asylum is there's a lot of really outstanding asylum cases, but everybody crossing the border doesn't have a, an asylum case that has that is going to be seen as having merit. So you go to the border because you're looking for multiple ways to get in. So that's my thought about what we could win on and lose on. If we lose, um, it won't be the social agenda. If we lose, it'll be either the economy or the idea that we can't manage the border. In my view, Sheila. Uh, what, what is the uh, situation with it? I never I can pronounce his name, the uh, uh, Mayorkas. What do you mean the situation? Uh, uh, Jordan is going to go after him and try to get rid of him. So I'm wondering well, think, why and how come. I think Biden will defend him as well as should, but to the extent that we haven't anticipated every thing that's happened at the border, including the expected end. I mean, Rule 42 in its COVID rule is preposterous. The Republican governors are saying, wait, we don't want people this in because of COVID when those same governors have been against vaccination. So obviously it's it needs to, it's it's morally bankrupt rule. The issue is what we will do in its absence to to keep the border from uh, to have there be an orderly process for the uh, decisions on asylum. The thing with my orcas is absolutely they'll try and kill him. And if it gets too deadly, He'll fall on his sword and say, you know, my family depends, demands my time. That'd be too bad because whatever we have or haven't done on immigration, this wouldn't be my orchestra's fault. These are the highest chambers of governor, government. All I can say is there's not an easy solution. So maybe what guidance Biden's being guilty of is being uh, human. Uh, he wants a compassionate policy at the border and he wants good law enforcement, and he wants a change in immigration law. But I want all those things too. I just don't want to look helpless while we're seeking them. Mm -hmm. Final questions, thoughts, and concerns. Do we have a good time or what? <laughs> I just, I want, I had my hand up. I just wanted to add um, that actually the judiciary might be interesting to watch because didn't uh, they appoint Jamie Raskin? Um, which is probably good insulation against maybe some of what Jordan's going to pull, right? I mean, he's good, right? Yeah. Who they appointed Jamie Raskin to do I, what? 
I think that he, he's um, was part of the Democratic leadership on the judiciary. I think he oh. got one of those appointments. Oh, he'll, be ranking, he'll be ranking minority. Yeah. yeah. And I well, thought, well, that's good. You know, there's some fight there. Yeah. yeah. So as you know, this is all made for TV. And so you want somebody, when Jim Jordan does that, you want somebody uh, to to be an eloquent defender of our position. So he's a good choice. Now, sometimes you get more than that. So I've said it to Dishery for years, uh, Richard Burr, and I guess it was Pat Leahy. Uh, yeah. Uh, they conspired to, to have an investigation of Trump. So, but you're not going to get that in the house. So the most you can hope for is somebody who who is is good on TV and articulate and can tease out the maniacal behavior of Jim Jordan, which will evidence itself. So you want that. And as you know, the January 6th committee has had several trained communicators doing that. And, and that's been a choreographed exercise and really has to be when you get show hearings like that. Um, eventually, since there's obviously no evidence that Joe Biden ever did anything, eventually it occurred to somebody that they're pillaring uh, Biden's son. I think Biden's son probably did make more money than if his name was Joe Wilson, but you might be able to say that about Jared Kushner, who's in bed with the Saudis for $2 billion. So, yeah. <laughs> so there's a leadership in that, a top 10, and Hunter Biden's not on. It does make you think of Billy Carter, Billy Beer. Oh, a yeah, little different as far as I'm concerned, but. Uh. <laughs> no, I think it is different. I'm saying there's always these allegations. Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, you know, when you were talking about governor, you know, because a lot of times governors do win nominations for presidency. They were for many, many decades. I, I, I when you said that Jay Inslee popped up in my head immediately. Um, I, I don't understand why he didn't do better uh, when in last time, but uh, what do you, anybody have? You used to ride the, you used to ride the ferry with, with him and, and uh, a lot. And, uh, I think I think he intended all along for it to be a great platform to get his name out and to draw attention to climate change. If I was advising Jay Inslee, which I am not, and he asked me my opinion on this matter, I think he made a, a miscalculation. If I was him, I would have done those two things and I am a governor and I have done and I have run things and this is an example of something that I did. Um, so I think governors do that a lot. Here mm -hmm. is in practice what I was able to accomplish on this matter. Right. And I, he didn't do that. He's been a good governor. He just didn't do that. Yeah, and he was in the House of Reps. And I mean, just to talk about it, an amazing you know, resume. You know, there's no shame in being a governor. It's his third term, so not everybody can be president, but I would have thought that that would show a little bit better. Uh, what happened, as you know, is Barack Obama decided that if we kept up like we were going to, going to heading after Super Tuesday, that we were vulnerable to uh, Trump. And it was Obama that talked to all those Democrats. All of a sudden, Biden went to South Carolina. He hasn't done that well up until now. And all of a sudden, he's our nominee, Presto Magico. And that's because they, the time to debate it was over and it was time for us to have a candidate. Uh, if I, I mean, I'm not so sure. We won by 7 million votes. I'm not so sure anybody else would have, I don't think anybody else would have won by more. And some might have lost. Yeah. Who knows? We won. <laughs> When, yeah. when is our governor race next? Is it two years or three years or what? Ew, good question. Ah. You know, that's so crazy. Why wouldn't I know that? Yeah, I know. I, it's not coming to He just about. ran two years ago. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. Two years. Oh, wait a minute. 
we better resolve this. So <laughs> there's well, I'm resolving it. I know we got to go. There's three people who want to be governor for sure: Dow Constantine, uh, Bob Ferguson, and Hillary Fl France. And so, they're all wonderful. Yeah. So it's what's happening is Patty and Maria aren't going anywhere. Patty's president pro tem. She just got elected for six terms. Maria's up in two years, and she'll run again uh, for her fifth term. So if you're a Democrat, if you're a Constantine, you, you, uh, if you're one of these three guys, you're waiting for the the, the governorship, and and I'm I'm certain that Jay won't uh, run again for a fourth okay. term. Yeah. So I think all we need to know beyond that is is when the heck his his term is up. Um, hold on. So you have anything you want to say to that? Well, I can give you the uh, November twenty twenty four is when he oh. next. Oh, okay. Okay. So um, so it is next time. So uh, that will give us, uh, yeah, we just did off here and it tracks the presidential year. It's not, it's not that many states that are off. So uh, it is next time and he won't run again. And, uh, you know, I think Ferguson's been, I, I like all three of them. I would note that when Patty ran, there was more than one serious male candidate. That's a long time ago that that happened. Including Don Bonker, who now lives on the island, who everybody thought was going to be senator, and I would say, if there's, if three of them go into the primary, I would not bet against Hillary, uh, who's a very able mm -hmm. politician and not incidentally, former Bainbridge City Council member. 